Hi, everybody. It's time to start. We got the thumbs up on time to start, so if we can get a seat, that'd be wonderful. Our first song tonight is Rescue the Perishing. Is this thing on? Is anybody listening? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's okay. All right. Learning how to evangelize or something like that's what he's going to be talking about. So we'll sing these couple of songs. First, second, fourth. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are slying him, still he awaiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with him earnestly, plead with him gently, he will forgive if they truly believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor, thy Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patient we win them. Tell the poor wanderer, say, your has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. All right. Will we not tell it today? If the name of the Savior is precious to you, if his care has been constant and tender and true, if the light of his presence is bright in your way, oh, will you not tell of your gladness today? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it today? If your faith in the Savior has brought its reward, if the strength you have found in the strength of your Lord, if the hope of the rest in his palace is sweet, oh, will you not, brother, the story repeat? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it today? If the souls all around you are living in sin, if the master has told you to bid them come in, if the sweet invitation they never have heard, oh, will you not tell them the cheer-bringing word? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it today? All right, well, good evening, everyone. Good to be with you here tonight, and we want to welcome those that are joining us uh, via Facebook Live as well. Let's go over a few congregational announcements, some prayer requests that have come in. Uh, then I will say a prayer, and then we'll introduce our speaker here for this evening. First of all, I want to give you an update that our sister Vicki Smith remains in Hutchinson Regional Medical Center. She's in room 4105 for rehab following her back surgery. Brother David Bartlett remains in the hospital. Prayers are requested for David and Judy and all those that are making decisions that are kind of regarding his long-term care situation. 
Our hearts and prayers do go out to the family of Marge Lowen. Uh, please keep her family, Debbie, Diane, Donna, and their families in your prayers. Services are going to be this Saturday uh, afternoon, 1.30 p.m. at uh, Elliott's Mortuary. Also, our deepest sympathy is extended to Autumn Walton and her family in the passing of her grandmother, Marsha Johnson. Uh, Marsha and Royce were members here at Eastwood uh, before moving to Stafford. Now, earlier on, our uh, text them all that we had sent out to our prayer warriors. So we were praying for uh, Larry Ham. Uh, Larry Ham is uh, father of uh, Rob uh, Gardner. He's uh, first cousin to a lot of the Hams that we're familiar with, with Janet, uh, John, who was here uh, last week. And I heard uh, perhaps even related to uh, Lizzie Hansen that comes to church uh, with us, but uh, Larry passed away at four o'clock this afternoon. We do want to uh, also uh, uh, let you know about uh, Sandy Brock is going to be celebrating her 90th birthday this Saturday from 2 to 4. An invitation is posted from across the nursery. Come and go bridal shower. That's going to honor uh, Maddie uh, Regeer and Jordan DeVault. It's going to be in the fellowship hall this Sunday from 1 to 2. They're registered at Amazon to donate toward a gift. See Melody Runyon, Carissa Runyon, or Michelle Schmucker. Uh, Maddie is the daughter of Don and Shelby and granddaughter of Lloyd and Wanda Schmitz. This Sunday, uh, we're going to have a back-to-school blessing. Uh, we are collecting school supplies. So if you're wondering, hey, what are all these bags of things up here? Those are the beginning uh, uh, remnant here of our school supply uh, collection that we'd like to be able to bless uh, some teachers and students here in our community. We want to say a special blessing over our students going back to school for teachers, educators, leaders that are involved. That's going to take place this upcoming Sunday. So if you'd like to drop those off, they'd be great here. You can bring them Sunday or we'll probably collect them for a week afterwards if you hadn't had a time to uh, purchase those. Uh, great agers are invited to bingo Saturday. That's August 26, 630 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Bring a dessert or a snack. To share and come for fun and prizes, contact the Fabians with questions. Anything else, Angela, you'd like to add to that, or does that kind of cover it? Should be a lot of fun, I, I would agree. We are uh, starting uh, our second session of the Grief Share, which is a 13-week video seminar and discussion uh, based support group. Um, it will begin on September 11th. It will run 13 consecutive Mondays from 6 to 8 until December 4th. There are still just a few slots available. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in or maybe you know somebody in the community or have a family member, um, that's a very, very transformative uh, ministry for people that have lost loved ones, uh, be a friend or as we've just announced here tonight, uh, so many people that we have known, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ that have, that have passed on. So that's, that's still available to sign up for. Um, is there anything that I have left off? I had a little bit of an extensive uh, list here tonight, but have we uh, left anything off? Yeah, thank you for that reminder there, Crystal. Yes, uh, Brother Neil Schmidtberger uh, called us uh, just shortly before uh, services and uh, had some tests uh, done here recently. Good results on that. And so he wanted to say thank you for the prayers and please keep them up. He has a scan coming up here fairly soon and just continue to pray for positive, positive numbers uh, for him. So very, very thankful uh, for that. Thank you for that reminder, Crystal. Okay, let's have a uh, word of prayer. And then we'll introduce our speaker uh, tonight. Heavenly Father, it is always so very good for us to be able to come together in your presence here uh, tonight. As we come, uh, Father, with uh, humility on our hearts, uh, with our love and devotion extended to you. Thank you for being our Father, our, our Creator. Thank you for sending uh, your Son, Jesus, our Savior, to this earth. We thank you for his courage for his obedience, his devotion to you, and uh, Father, for the tremendous sacrifice on the cross and the, and the hope that we find three days later through the resurrection. So Father, when we mention funerals, when we mention the, the death and the departure of beloved uh, family members, uh, members of uh, your forever body, uh, Father, it does hurt uh, with their departure and that loss of relationship in this life but father uh, we are not without hope and so our, our hearts do rejoice with homecomings 
forever homecomings of, of those that knew you. And so we, we celebrate uh, uh, that journey. And we just want to pray for families that are grieving, that have lost uh, loved ones, that you would comfort them and that you would use us as a means of, of comfort as well. We do want to pray for our sister Vicki Smith as she continues to recover from a very serious back surgery up in the hospital for our brother David Bartlett that's uh, facing long-term medical uh, care issues and just strengthen him, uh, be with his wife Judy and all the many decisions that she needs to make. Uh, Father, we do want to uh, uh, pray for uh, folks like our sister Sandy Brock celebrating 90 years here on this uh, planet and what a blessing she is uh, to the Eastwood family and to her family and, and friends that have just known her for so many years. We pray that goes well. We 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 um, thankful for the the Golden Agers and and the Fabians as they minister to uh, that group of our our, our folks here. And uh, what a blessing that they are. And just pray uh, your hand to be upon uh, their many activities. I pray for our, for our teachers, our our students. I pray for our church family as as we. We teach and as we serve, and um, uh, thinking of our speaker here tonight, appreciate uh, Brother Kenny Graham coming our way and just ask for your blessing to be upon him as he shares with us about the vital work of evangelization in this world. And it's in uh, Jesus' name that we pray this evening. Amen. All right, here is our speaker tonight. We have known Kenny for many years, but just a little brief background on him. Uh, Kenny was born and raised in Hutchinson. He graduated from Hutchin Hutchinson High School. He was baptized in 1973, was a member of Walnut and Campbell Church of Christ for four years before moving to Texas for preacher training following his graduation from Sunset International Bible Institute in 1979. He preached uh, in Port Townsend, Washington for five years. He moved back to Kansas in 1984. He's preached in Wyndham, Kansas since 1985. To the present time, Kenny and his wife Brenda are blended family with 13 grandchildren. Any more than 13? Still stuck on that 13 number? On hold. Uh, right on hold for right now. All right. Said he's living the dream. Uh, he has interest in sports and fishing and camping, and occasionally he said he gets a good night's sleep. But we are thrilled to have Kenny with us here tonight. So come up here and preach the word, brother. Well, let me start by saying, hello. I want to, uh, I don't know how, much, how many years y'all been doing this, but I've been here for all of them. I don't know, 15, 20, Wednesday, some, something like that. So uh, I guess you could say I've become a fixture a little bit, but I'm glad to be here. I want to read you a text. Just. I'll tell you what it is, but I want you to just listen to this, what the Lord says. It's in Luke 5, first for 10 verses. <clears throat> One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. He said to Simon, now go out where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we have worked hard all night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. Shout for help, brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck 
by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. I must confess that when I first looked at the list of of subjects, I, I, I saw this one and it said, how to evangelize. And I have to be totally transparent with you. When I saw that, I snickered a little bit. Let me explain. I thought, now, wait a minute, you know, we're talking about evangelizing. We're not talking about changing the plugs in my truck or the change in the oil or, you know, the how to do step by step because <clears throat> there's definitely maybe some how to to it. But man, it's, 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 it's a process that we're talking about here. And so the last thing that the Lord told the first soldiers, you know, soldiers of Christ arise, the last thing that he told them was what? Go. Go. And brothers and sisters have been trying to get that right ever since. The marching orders go. So I will try to give us a few ideas, hopefully, that will help us to, to do just that, to go, and, and to, to follow this directive, to follow this, uh, these orders. Um, there is no question that I, what, let me tell you, I, I, I'm, uh, Wayne said, I, uh, those of you who have known me for a while know that uh, I've got quite a background in fishing for fish. And I mean, I, I, I've probably, if there's one thing on earth that I've been doing longer than anything else, other than maybe walking and talking, is fishing. And I can definitely tell you that I have probably learned more from my mistakes about fishing than I have for my victories. And there's more defeats in fishing than there are victories, generally speaking. And so, here, though, we're talking about fishing, the Lord says, fishing for people. But, um, you know, what is evangelism? The term evangelist, that, that's probably the most accurate term to describe a, a, a preacher, but it's not just about preachers. Evangelist, um, if you like Greek, is from euangelistes, euangelistes, and it just simply means bringer of good news. So, regardless of who you are, what your abilities are, what, how much you know, or we all are in, you know, if we're in Christ, we're in possession of good news. And so the question then becomes, well, what do we do with that good news? See? So that's, that's, that's what uh, tonight's all about. Evangelizing isn't for a select few people. It's for the church. And, it's, and everybody has a role in it. Generally speaking, when somebody comes to Christ, there are a number of individuals that are involved in that, not just one person. Generally speaking, that's true. So <clears throat> let's start with the basis of evangelism. I'm going to give you six real quick bases for evangelism. But before, if you're, if you're taking any kind of notes, I'm going to give you six, I'm also going to give you six evangelistic passages 
that talk about going. Of course, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the one who says, go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I am with you always. Mark 16, 14 and 18, 14 through 18. Luke 24, 46 through 47. John 20, 19 through 23. And Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. So what's the basis for evangelism? Well, the basis, obviously, we've said is go, but it's based on all authority. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, before he said to go into the world and make disciples, you know what he said? He said, all authority resides with me in heaven and on earth. Well, that's pretty big, you know. Heaven and earth, that's, that's, that's quite a bit of authority, isn't it? And so that is the first basis that we have to go. All authority resides with him, and he's the one who says, go. Um, also, we find within that the second basis is there are no boundaries. You know, we're, it, it's, evangelism isn't just for Kansas. It isn't just for the United States. It's for everyone. And, and so there's no boundaries. It's based on learning. That's number three. It's based on learning. What does disciple mean? Learner. That's all the word means, learner. You, if you're in Christ, you are a student of God. You are a student of life. You're a student of God. You never, ever quit learning. Number four, it's based on obedience. It's based on when, when we say yes to God, there's an expectation. Well, what is that expectation? That he expects us to repent. And don't ever get the idea that repent is a one-time thing. There might be an initial, there might be the initial thing of repentance where you turn and say, I'm not going this way anymore. I'm going a different direction. That's what the word means. But repentance, if you really understand it, Repentance is something that you will be doing for the rest of your life. If you're a soldier of Christ, you will be doing that for the rest of your life. Your tweaking, your, your thinking, your attitude always needs tweaking about something, right? Absolutely it does. The fifth basis for evangelism. <clears throat> is relevance. Is there relevance? Yeah. I want someone to step up and tell me, if you can, what you could have done today that a hundred years from now will be more important than evangelism. Than teaching somebody making an effort for them to get to know their creator, for them to improve their lives, for them to improve everything. What, what did you do today that 100 years from today will make any difference? Something to think about, isn't it? It really is. But when you're trying to make disciples, that's relevant. And it's based on faithfulness. After he said go, what else did he say? Go to, go, go to the nations, and I'll what? I'll always be with you. I'll always be with you. So those are what I call the, the six bases for evangelizing. But there's caution. Matthew 23, 15. The context is Jesus is in the temple. He's talking to the, he's talking to the experts in religion. 
there. He's talking to the scribes, the Pharisees, perhaps the chief priests. And if you read Matthew 23, you, many of you already know this, it is a blistering account of how Jesus lays the law down to organize religion. <clears throat> but he makes, in, in thinking about evangelism, <clears throat> he makes a shocking statement. It must have shocked people that day. You know what he said? It's in verse 15. He says, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of the religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell that you yourselves are. How do you think that went over? Can you imagine? What's he saying there? You really, have you really ever thought about that, what he's saying there? He's saying, you go through all this elaborate ritual to make a convert. And he said, by the time you're done with them, you're worse off, they're worse off, than they were before they knew you. And you wonder why they wanted to murder him? So when you think about that, he says, you people would have been better off to never have known you. You know what that tells me? That when I go out to be an ambassador for Christ, and I go out and I try to influence somebody for Christ, I have got to be caution. I have got to be careful. I have got to teach them not only the right thing, but I have got to live it for them too. I've got to show them Christ, not just tell them Christ. So this warning, you know, zeal sometimes can be damaging. Have you ever, all of us can think of examples of religious zeal that hurt so many people, right? Remember Jonestown, Guyana? That's just but, but one. You know, you can make a whole list. But zeal gone wrong is, is really, really damaging. Zeal gone wrong says to people who might be inquisitive a little bit, I don't want anything to do with this God you're talking about. I don't want anything to do with that. You have shown me that I don't want any of that in my life. And so when evangelizing, there has to be an element of caution to it, which begs the question, as I'm maybe trying to help people, what am I converted to? Now that's a, that's a soul searching question, isn't it? You know, some people are simply converted to the church and its policies and its, and its rituals, its traditions, its, uh, honestly, I hope that's not you. But what are you converted to? And what are you supposed to be converted to? I, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm challenging you. I'm challenging myself here. Why am I trying to, what am I trying to convert the potential disciple to? My way of thinking and everything? Is that it? Sometimes. That, you, know, you and I both know sometimes. That we know that happens. So we need to be sure we're converted to the do the right thing. I mean, conversion is a process. Paul talks a lot of, in Romans 12 about conversion and about transformation. And, and the longer that I've been a Christian and the, the longer that I observe myself and I observe life and, and everything about it, I see why the transformation is needed so badly. You can't 
you can't come up with any earthly issue that transforming ourselves to be like God wouldn't help, wouldn't deal with the root problem. And so we have to know what we're converted to. It's, it's much more consuming than baptism. You know, disciple making and baptism are almost in the same sentence here. Compared to disciple making, when you really understand what that means, that, I hope you'll understand this. Baptism is the easy part. <laughs> I mean, you, you convince that someone from the scriptures that Jesus was the Son of God and that they're a sinner and that, that, that they're without him, they're, there's no hope, and you want to go to heaven and, and all of that, and you say, well, if you really believe he's who he said he was and you're willing to try to change and be like him, your next step is to be baptized. And a lot of people have done that. And a lot of people have just got wet, as they say, too. That's the easy part, the baptizing part. Not that it's easy, not if it's done right. But compared to discipleship, compared to making a disciple and what that really means, it's easy by comparison. <clears throat> the object of evangelizing is Jesus. And why you need him. So that's why I say people have been known to say, well, I'm trying to make them see what I see and think like I think and do, do like, just think like, you know, believe all the same things I do. Well, not necessarily. You're never going to think, we're never, you know, you don't want to be like, you want to, you want to, well, let me encourage you, you want to think for yourself in light of the scriptures. You want to think for yourself. But the anchor point and the pinnacle of trust and, and what you want to imitate is the Lord, Jesus. There's never been anybody like him and there never will be. The God-man. When I think that if I'm going to evangelize, I'm going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to make these people just believe all the things that I believe about everything. That's kind of a high view of myself, isn't it? Didn't it? <laughs> kind of a high view of myself. Well, that falls under this business of being cautious about how we evangelize and, and what we're actually evangelizing to. Sometimes the church in the past has been presented as, oh, we want you to join our club. We want you, you know. Well, they mean well. But the Church of Christ, the body of Christ, is not a club. The body of Christ is an alive organism of people that recognize who the leader is and what he is. All authority in heaven and earth resides with him. And the members of the body, if they're converted to the right thing, they know this. They know it. And <clears throat> so we don't want to. So the goal, generally speaking, is to teach them who Jesus is and what he expects of us as his people. What he expects. That's what we really need to know. And uh, not just join my club. Jesus doesn't have a club like that. But I think that personal freedom needs to be mentioned here too. Um, because when, when we become a disciple in the right way and we're converted to the right thing, we become I don't want you to lose this, but we become free, more free than we could ever be 
without that. Do you realize, uh, I don't think most of us as Christians really understand the freedom that we have. So often Christianity is portrayed as an enslavement, a keep rule keeping. It's, it's not that. It is a way of life, but it's, it's becoming like Jesus. And the more you become like Jesus, the less you're afraid of anything. And you really begin to live as life was intended to be lived. And the thing is, that's what we all want. Maybe we can't articulate it very well, but that's what we all want. We all want that freedom. We all want that boldness. We all want that security that we know who we belong to. We know why we're here. We know where we're going. And not only that, it has stood the test of time. It has stood the test of time like nothing else. The, the, the word of God and the gospel and the church has stood the test of worldwide. Tell me something that's really lasted and stood the test of time more than Christ and his gospel. There's not. There's no such thing. And Jesus has said in John 14, 27, he says, I'm giving you the gift of peace of mind, not as the world gives do I give you, but my peace. It's different. It's different. It's, it doesn't depend on circumstances. It doesn't depend on circumstances. And that's so different, so refreshing. Now then, if we're going to evangelize, we have to have then, this is the last thing I want to really talk about. We have to have the right approach. If we're really going to make disciples, we have to have something. Agreed? We have to have something that looks attractive. Agreed? It makes sense to me. It, it, we, we need to be attractive. That needs to be defined. I need to define that for you. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16 says, You must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living and satisfy, to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scripture says, you must be holy because I am holy. That is it. Well, what would that look like? What would that look like, see? Holy. You know what that word means? The, the, the world thinks if you're holy, you know, you, you walk around like this all the time. Right? I mean, really. Come on. That, that's kind of the world's view. But what is holy? You know what the word? Uncommon. Uncommon. There's nothing like, well, when you think of Christ, you think of Jesus as a person, as a, as, as a human being that looked like anyone. There's nothing like him, was there? Nothing. Uncommon. That's what's to be attractive. Yeah, but we'll take it a little further. I'm still not quite clear. You're to become like God. I've tried to define what, what that would look like in cornbread terms. I call it, what I call it, is no strings, people. You and I are to be, if we're the body of Christ, you and I are to be no strings people. What does that mean? 
It means we go around doing good and we don't have this expectation of being paid back in some way for doing good. But we do good because we're imitating our God. And we do good because he's good. And that's what he's taught us to do. The other thing is, if you would do that and I would do that consistently, we'd be so much happier. Oh, you know, that's it. <laughs> that if I would just give so much more thought to the other person, the other guy, instead of me, oh, I'd be so much better off. But a no strings person. The church is to be a no-strings church. We do good. We hope you'll come back. We hope you might be interested in, in knowing about God, and we'd love to teach you, and we'd love to share our faith with you because it's done so much for us. But we're going to do good to you no matter what. Why? Because that's how God is. He sends his rain on the good and the bad, doesn't he? That is what, in a world like you live in right now, that is so attractive, <laughs> isn't it? That is so attractive that I'm going to help you and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this for you, and the, there's no string attached to it, not at all. Well, brothers and sisters, that's also how we need to be collectively. And that sort of thing, so what are you saying? That sort of thing makes a difference. People will see that. But how? Well, people will be attracted to that. Some won't be attracted to that. You do realize, and I have, I'll say this a little bit more in just a moment. You do realize, no matter how much effort you make, for some people, it won't matter. You do realize that, don't you? You can, you can try your guts out, as they say, and sometimes it, it's just not going to, right? We all have a will. We all have a choice. And God doesn't make people have a relationship with him. He doesn't make them. He's not going to back you in that corner over there and says, you're going to have a relationship with me no matter... No, no. no. He says, I want to have a relationship with you. I want, to, I want to teach you. I want you to be at peace. I want you to be full of love and good works. And I want you to, I want you to become what you were created to become. But I won't make you. If you don't want me, I won't force myself on you. So, you know, how do we get there? You know, anymore, I don't tell people much, though you should, but I don't put it this way. I don't say to people much anymore, oh, make sure you read your Bible this week. Well, why not? Because it's not like reading the newspaper. It's not like reading an, some novel or something. What do you need to do with it? I'll tell you what you need to do with it. And I need to do it. You need to meditate on it. You need not to worry about reading. So, well, I've got to read two or three chapters in this in the Old Testament today. And I've got to read a chapter or two in the New Testament. This day on schedule. That has its place, don't get me wrong, that has its place, so that you get through and you, and, you know, you familiarize yourself with the whole thing. But what is needed is meditation. We don't do much with meditation, really. But meditation is what the scriptures, because there's nothing like them. That's God talking to you. That's God speaking. And, and so we need, to, we need to meditate on his word. And to evangelize, right, you can't, keep, you can't leave that out of it. You've got to have that in. You can't leave his word out of the equation. 
So how do we get people how do we get people interested in the right way? Well, it goes just back to what I just said a minute ago about friendship, about no strings friendship, no strings relationships, about you show them by what you do that you're uncommon, you're holy. And that comes from God. It doesn't come from any place else. You don't get that joining the Rotary Club. You don't get that joining the Kiwanis. Nothing wrong with those organizations, but that isn't. You get that in God's house. But it starts with friendship. And we, the other thing we have to keep in mind is that when you're talking about making disciples, you're talking about an investment in time. You realize that making someone, helping someone become a disciple of Christ is a lengthy, usually speaking, is a lengthy process. And you are, and if you're going to be a part of that, it's going to take you to invest yourself in another person, and it's going to take your personal time and my personal time. Sometimes I think we'd like to hear anything but that, but, but that's the truth. And you know what? We need not be in a hurry. Everybody will progress at their speed if they're going to progress. They will do it. It doesn't mean you can't give somebody a kick in the pants now and then. It doesn't mean that. But, but we need to be willing and ready to invest the time with people to help them become something. Jesus C.S. Lewis called him. He says, we are to become, this is the way he put it. You've, you've probably all heard of C.S. Lewis. He says, we're to be, all become little Christs. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, that's, that's right. But this is what attracted people to Jesus from the beginning. Jesus did all these things. He was different. He's, yeah, it says he spoke with authority like like the teachers of the law did not, because theirs was just a rote and ritual thing, and his was straight from the heart of God, because it was God. But it was different. He cared. People sensed that he cared. They knew it. He invested himself in people, particularly 12 men, particularly three, especially. And that's what we have. We have to be like that ourselves with people. Being no strings friends, being holy, um, and the other thing when you're doing this, you have to be able to let people see that you know, you know why you believe what you believe, and that you know why you disbelieve what you disbelieve. You're not just some brainwashed product, but if somebody were to stop you and ask you, why are you, why are you a Christian? That, and 1 Peter 3.15 says such a thing, you would be willing and able and willing to take the time to say, this is why I believe this, this is why I don't believe that. Can you do that? Can you do that? something to ponder. When your faith is your own, people are attracted to that. When they see that you know why you believe what you believe, they're attracted to that. And they know the difference. And you see, that it's very attractive in a world of religious parrots. What is a religious parrot? How much do parrots actually know for themselves? Not very much, is it? What do they do? They repeat what? 
what they've heard, but they have no idea why. We're to be better than that. We're to be better than that. We're to be able to tell why we believe what we believe. Now, I'm just about done. One last thing. And this is for all of us. Because, you know, when somebody comes to Christ and they come for the right reasons and they become a disciple and they mature, I don't know anything more rewarding if you had a hand in that. And it usually almost always is a team effort, okay? Not just a preacher's doing stuff. It's a, it's a team effort. But there's nothing more rewarding than seeing that happen to somebody that's real. You know, the real thing. But here's my warning. That's not a warning. Just a reminder. It, it, that's such a rewarding thing. But the opposite side of that is that you're going to have more, if you're serious about this, you're going to have more failures than you have victories. Did you hear what I said? You're going to have more failures than you are victories with people about this. Well, what's your basis for that, Kenny? Matthew 7, 13 and 14. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But... The gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. Who said that, Kenny? No. No, Kenny didn't say that. Jesus said that. What does that mean? It means that more people won't than will. And that can be very, very discouraging to those of you who out of your sincere love for God are trying to help his kingdom grow, but most people aren't interested. Don't ever forget that. And I say that only to remind us to not get discouraged if you're rebuffed. Okay? If you're rebuffed and people think you're half crazy and oh, I didn't realize. Can you believe that guy? That's not about you. That's how the Lord said what? How it will be. And, and it's good, you know what? I've been, I've been doing this long enough to know that you have to remember things like that or you'll, well, if I didn't know that, I would probably give out a long time ago. And that's just playing into the enemy's hand. So I'm telling you that so you don't become discouraged. Because usually if you get discouraged and you have a bad experience about that, guess what? You know what human nature is? I'm not going to try to do that anymore. I'm not going to try to do that because uh, people laughed at me. I was insulted. People, they were indifferent to me. I'm not, I, I, that's just not my thing. No, no, don't think like that. Realize the Lord said it would be like that. Paul said, we're not ignorant of the schemes of the devil. <laughs> well, that's one of them, you know, right there. Trying to get you so discouraged, thinking you can't, thinking you can't influence anybody that you don't try at all. Don't, don't buy that lie. Don't buy that lie. Yes, you can. Can I tell you a quick story about Port Townsend, Washington? Very quick. For years, I worked on this couple. Studied with them every week. I knew he wasn't interested, but it seemed like maybe the, the wife was. Well, this guy was disabled, and so he says, I'll study with you if you'll, if you'll let me teach you how to play chess. You know the game chess? Okay, you know. 
And uh, so, I, so I learned to play chess by trying to evangelize. Well, I studied with them and visited with them and tried to do things for them for over three years. Never, I never got anywhere. Ten years goes by, I go back to Port Townsend for a visit, and somebody says, I, they had me come back and preach. And this lady, th this couple that I'm telling you about, she's there. And somebody said, oh, she was baptized about five years ago. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, a bunch of ladies got together and befriended her and studied with her and, you know, took her in. They could get through to her. I couldn't. That was... Preachers can't always do it. But those women, kid, they did it. I might have planted a few seeds, you know, along, but, but they did it. And that's what I say. It's, it's teamwork. The littlest things you can do can contribute to a soul, to a disciple. And don't get discouraged if people don't respond. What's your job in life? Plant seeds. That's my whole existence. All I do is plant seeds, and you do too. Let's just plant the right seeds in the right way and ask God to help you to do it. And I guarantee you, he will. Well, thank you for listening. Let's close it out with a prayer. Father, thank you for loving us, for putting up with our impatient ways, for putting up with our depression and our down and out attitudes, sometimes self-centered attitudes. I know that you love us anyway. Help us to learn to be like Jesus was, a no strings person and help this church and all your churches, Father, wherever they are to grow and to prosper and mature and to be a bright spot in this dark world. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending Jesus and showing us who you really are. In his name, amen.